you're listening to the Mark Moss Show. Of course, we're always talking about the decentralized revolution, and I always talk about you know three revolutionary cycles, and today we're talking about one of those, which is the financial revolution cycle and how that is happening right now. Of course, we're talking about how the Fed's back is against the wall, and we're talking about specifically how they've been raising rates to try to bring inflation down. And I was saying how most people think about the 70s inflation and the Paul Volcker and the Arthur Burns and how that's wrong. And really, you need to look at the 40s for better inflation to understand it. Because what the Fed is doing, they're trying to attack the wrong thing. They're trying to make you and I, retail spending, go down. But the problem is it's the governments that are spending the, problem, spending the money. And the problem is, is that the more they raise rates, the worse it gets for the government and the more money they spend. It's deficit spending. That's what we're talking about. And, the, and like you and I, when we go broke, we stop spending money. The government <laughs> doesn't. The government doesn't. The government just runs bigger deficits. That's what they do. Um, and so when inflation is caused by runaway fiscal deficits, government deficits, then high interest rates won't stop it. They won't do much to do it. And basically what it does is because, like I said, it forces the governments to just finance it. It, it forces the governments to borrow even more money. But the problem is, is, like I said, is that as the Fed is raising rates and then the government's borrowing more money, the cost of that borrowing goes up. But it also does something else that's really bad. What it also does is... As they're trying to bring you and I, our spending down, consumer spending down, they're making us broke. So our houses aren't worth as much. Our stocks aren't worth as much. We're not buying and selling as much stuff, but we're not making as much money. And what that does is then we don't pay as much taxes. So it's a double whammy for the government. One, they don't get near as much revenue. So that makes a bigger deficit. And two, the interest on the debt went up. So that makes a bigger deficit. So now the deficit is going up two times. It's like a really, really, really bad situation for the government, which is why all of this just makes the problem even worse. We can see that over time, raising interest rates and keeping them high um, in, a, in an environment like we're in now with runaway government deficits and high government debts are causing inflations um, and they just make it worse. All right. Now, to understand this a little bit, we want to take a look at um, some other examples when, when this has happened and what's going on. And we can look back into some other examples like, for example, in Turkey. So in Turkey, we can see that they've been running massive inflation over there. As a matter of fact, we've been seeing 80% inflation uh, for the last couple of years. But what Turkey did is as inflation started going up, they cut rates. But as they cut rates, inflation went even higher. But eventually, it started coming back down. They cut interest rates to under 15%, and inflation exploded to over 80%, but for a period of time. The money supply and the consumer price index ended up taking off like a rocket ship for Turkey. But the problem with Turkey's situation is that cutting interest rates did reduce the portion of inflation caused by fiscal deficits, but it made the speculative attacks on the currency and inflation caused by bank lending. So this is the problem. If the Fed raises rates, then what happens is then people don't want to hold the currency or more specifically, they'll borrow against it and cause that speculative attack. Nobody wants to hold the lira especially foreign uh, lira is the Turkish um, currency, and especially foreign entities. So what they want to do is they want to borrow in lira. So, for example, when inflation was at 9% and I could get a house loan at 3%, then I definitely wanted to do that. And as a matter of fact, I got a couple of them. <laughs> because what happens is, remember, at the beginning of this um, episode, we started talking about how they inflate debts away because you get paid you know, five years, 10 years down the road at that new inflated amount, but your debt was locked in at that old rate. So if I can get a 30-year fixed loan at 30% and inflation is above that, 5%, 7%, 9%, then I want to borrow as much money as I can and let the inflation pay it off. So in Turkey, that's exactly what happens. But the problem is that becomes a speculative attack. So now, as many people as they can, they're borrowing more money. But as they borrow more money, that just makes the problem even worse. And then they don't want to hold the currency. So it's called a speculative attack. Now, Argentina saw a similar problem. They had inflation rate of over 100%. I mean, imagine that, 100%. That means your money basically becomes worthless every year. But unlike Turkey, they, they started aggressively raising interest rates to keep up with it. But yet, inflation remains completely uncontained. They haven't been able to do anything about it. It's almost as, as if interest rate policy isn't the only variable to consider, which, of course, it's not. 
That's the whole point that I'm talking about. Now, what we have, we're looking back at the 1940s, what really caused it was war, right? They had to spend money to go to World War II. And we had, of course, the uh, pandemic war, <laughs> the war on the pandemic, the war on COVID, right? So if inflation is caused by a war or by a demographics bulge or a high rate of bank lending, then it's pretty fixable, right? Just after the war, bring spending back down. Um, if it's a high rate of bank lending, then get the banks to lend less money, right? However, like I said, if, the, if, if you can fix it once the war ends, if, government if the government returns back to their budget, then things sort of go away. In the 1910s and the 1940s, the U.S. had high deficit-driven inflation, but had a clear way to bring it down after the war. Why could they do that? Well, the reason why is because back then, they didn't have the entitlement spending, and this is where the proverbial rock in the hard place comes into play. This is why this time is different. Back in the 1940s, they didn't have the entitlement spending, which is the Medicare, the Medicaid, the Social Security, the interest on the debt, the military spending, all those things. They weren't locked in. And they had a very low amount of workers that were dependent on the system. Today, it's the opposite. Today, we have the federal governments have bulged and we have more people working for the federal government than ever before, so dependent on the government. We also have the entitlement spending, which is higher than it's ever been at any point. And the government does not make enough revenue to even pay the mandatory spending. The entitlement spending doesn't pay that. Now, in the 70s, the U.S. had a low sovereign to debt uh, level of about 30% debt to GDP. That was in the 70s when you hear about Arthur Burns and, and uh, Volcker. So it had an easy path to raising the rates because the government didn't have that much debt. So go ahead and raise the rates. It didn't really matter because the government's, the, the amount of debt that the government has is just a little bit. So yeah, it makes that debt more expensive, but it's not that big of a deal. Okay. But today we have a debt to GDP of 125%. So from 30 to 125%, it's a pretty big deal. So the hardest inflation combination for any central bank to deal with is three things. One, a high sovereign debt to GDP ratio. In the 70s, it was 30%. Today, it's 125. Two, large and structural fiscal deficits tied to age demographics and imbalanced entitlement programs and high military spending. Hmm, that's a problem. We have high military spending. Check. We just went from the war on the pandemic to now we're at war in Ukraine and potentially war with China. Uh, two, imbalance entitlements programs. Yes, I told you we, we can't even afford those. They're at the highest point ever. Uh, age demographics, so the baby boomer generation is the largest segment of the population. And then three, a significant supply constraint such as tight oil markets or labor shortages due to high public debt levels. So significant supply constraints on such tight oil markets and labor storage. So the Biden administration has done everything they can to shut down oil in the United States. So we have supply constraints on oil. And because of the high interest rates, it imposes capital constraints and makes it very hard for the oil companies to get more oil out. Sounds like we're in a pretty bad situation. And so they're trying to bring out the 1970s playbook, but it's just not working. Now, they can reduce money creation from bank lending in the intermediate term, but Ironically, it only makes inflation worse. So that's exactly what's playing out at this point. Uh, fun, 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 fun. Now, let's talk about the 1940s playbook, right? Let's talk about the 1940s playbook and how they can, if they keep interest rates low, even though we have high inflation, how it could actually reduce the fiscal-driven inflation a bit. But the problem is, as I said, if they do that, then it encourages speculative attacks on the currency. If they bring rates down, and inflation's running high, everybody's going to want to borrow the money and attack the currency. Now, one of the ways you can sort of bypass a lot of this is uh, the same way you've been able to bypass it for thousands of years, and that's with gold. Now, I like to hold a little bit of gold just for this situation. I know a lot of people ask me, where do I get gold? And I get it from Universal Coin and Bullion. I love Universal Coin and Bullion because they have very low prices on, very, on, on the most popular silver and gold bullion coins. And I trust them because I've spent quite a bit of time with the CEO, Mike Fulgen. He's uh, Universal Coins president. He wrote the consumer alert on gold coins for the Texas Attorney General. And they also have low prices. I can trust them. They got great prices. Um, and he's got a very special deal just for my listeners. You can get a one-ounce gold American Eagle coin, which is the most popular gold bullion coin in the world at his 
dealer cost of only 3.5% over spot gold price. Plus, he's even going to give you free shipping on it if you mention my name, Mark Moss. Give him a call, 1-800-UCB-GOLD. Again, that's 1-800-UCB-GOLD. Tell him Mark Moss sent you. He's even going to send you his 30-page national winning gold guide for free, all ships for free, 1-800-UCB-GOLD, or go online to universalcoin.com slash Mark Moss. Again, universalcoin.com slash Mark Moss. We're talking about the Fed, the Fed, the central bank uh, policy and how, you know, the we'll just take it higher for longer. We'll just keep it higher. Uh, what the Fed's doing to fight inflation and how it's completely wrong and how they're really stuck. They're really between the proverbial rock and a hard place. Unfortunately, there's maybe only one way out of this and it's not good. As a matter of fact, it's not good at all. So they've been raising rates to try to bring inflation down. But the problem is, as I've been explaining, if you've missed it, go back and listen on the podcast. Just search the Mark Moss Show on your favorite podcast player. Or catch me on YouTube at, at Market Disruptors. But as they've been raising rates, they haven't really slowed inflation down because it's not the consumer's spending that's the problem. It's the government's spending that's the problem. And the government's going to spend no matter what they do with the rates. But what it does do is it makes the government spend even more for two reasons. One, as they raise the rates, consumers, you and I, or more broke, which is what they're trying to do. And so the government doesn't have as much, they don't have as much income. We don't pay as much taxes. So the government's income goes down, which means they need to spend more deficit spending, more debt. And because interest rates went up, the cost of that debt, the payments on the debt go up. As a matter of fact, the United States government debt, the interest on the debt has now eclipsed the amount of money that the U.S. spends on its military. Now, the U.S. spends more money on its military than the next 10 countries combined more than china more than russia more than france england britain whatever all of them combined and the interest not paying down the debt just the interest on the debt has now eclipsed that so it's really causing a problem now as i said in the 1940s playbook if they were to keep interest rates low even though inflation was high um, then it could reduce the fiscal the government's inside of the inflation a little bit but it encourages a speculative attack on the currency where we go borrow as much in that currency as we can to go buy any assets that we can, like how I went and bought a couple properties when I could get 30-year fixed at 3% when inflation was over that. All right, I explained how that works before. I'm not going to go through that again. So what do they do? It's a pretty dangerous situation. If we don't raise rates and inflation runs hot, we get the speculative attack. If we do continue to raise rates, then we just make inflation worse. So what do we do? Well, this is where things get a little scary. So if we, let's, let's just run this back one more time. So let's see, if we continue to raise rates, we make retail broke, um, but that doesn't really solve the problem and it actually makes the government deficits worse because of the, the deficit spending. Hmm. But if we, do lower rates, it will reduce the government deficit spending, which is the main problem, but then we open ourselves up to um, speculative attacks. So there's a third potential choice, and this is where it starts getting scary. And this is what basically every single empire and country in the world eventually leads to. This is the final stage. When this happens, it's kind of over. Uh, a lot of the world has this, and a lot of the United States has it, but we don't have it on a big scale, and that is something called capital controls. Capital controls are basically controlling the capital, controlling the money, controlling the flow of money in and out of the country, and also the price of goods. So for example, in California, in Los Angeles, for example, they have rent control, right? That's a price control. It's a capital control. So, well, rents are going up too much, so we'll just say that homeowners can't raise the price of those rents anymore, right? But capital controls are much worse because it controls the flow of capital in and out. I uh, literally uh, just today at the time of this recording uh, got home from being over in Spain where I was at a, at a conference. I was speaking at a conference over there and most of the people there were international, which I guess is why I was in Spain. Probably at least two thirds of the group were international and they're all business, business people, entrepreneurs, etc. cetera. Um, and many of them I talked to from sort of like the Nor Nordic countries. So Denmark, um, Finland, Sweden, et cetera. And uh, I was really surprised, like in the Netherlands, for example, I didn't understand the extent of the capital controls that they have. And so these are business owners, and um, they're doing business selling, you know, whatever they're selling, uh, supplements or fitness equipment or whatever, all across Europe. But the government doesn't want money to go in and out of the country. 
And so it makes it very difficult for them to do business. Um, some of the team that ran the event are from Argentina. Argentina has some of the highest inflation in the world, and they also have capital control. So, for example, you have this, the Argentine, I think it's the Argentine peso, that's losing 100% of its value, and so you don't want to hold that, right? So you want to exchange it for something else. Well, what would you exchange it for? Well, people would like to exchange it for a dollar. So the official exchange rate, I don't have it pulled up in front of me, so don't quote me exactly, but the government tells you that the official exchange rate, because they're trying to make it look like it's not so bad, is like 250 to 1, 250 um, Argentine pesos to $1. But they only allow you to exchange, and they just told me this this last weekend, so I don't have it written down. So again, sorry for my uh, not being completely factual, but something like um, the government only allows you to exchange you know, $100 of that or something like that. So then there's a black market for that, and the black market is like 500 to 1 approximately because people don't want to hold the Argentine peso. They want a dollar. So even though the official rate says that, since they can't really do much of it, they'll just pay the black rate, 500, 550 to one. But here's the thing. The government won't let you spend more than, I mean, I should have written these numbers down. I think it was like $300 on their credit card. So these people, they're in Spain, they're traveling from Argentina, but they can't spend money on the credit card. Uh, well, they, they can, but only up to like a couple hundred dollars. Once they go over that, then it's way worse than even the black market rate. Then it's like exchange at like a 700 to 1 ratio. Why do they do that? Because they know that the people are going to be dumping the Argentine peso as fast as they possibly can, causing a speculative attack. That's exactly what they don't want. And so that's the only way to stop it. Nobody's going to want to hold a currency when inflation is running that high. And that's exactly where the United States finds itself in. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. Inflation's raging high. The more we raise rates, the worse it actually gets. But if we lower rates, we have a speculative attack. So what do we do? Well, we do what every other country in the world has done, is doing right now, and that is imposing capital controls. And like I said, that is very, very, very scary, especially, you know, being in the United States, the land of the free. We don't want our money being locked down. But of course, this is what they have to do. It's the only way they can do it. It's the only way they can uh, do it if they want to try to protect their currency. Um, some countries, you know, Argentina, Nigeria, they've completely cut off access points to cryptocurrency because, again, people will trade their currency that's losing value for anything. It's what uh, Ludwig von Mises calls the crack-up boom. And he says, and then suddenly the people realize that inflation is both permanent and intentional. And then they lose all confidence and they want to exchange that currency for anything they can as fast as they can, and the currency ultimately plummets. Unless... <laughs> The government doesn't allow you to do it. It's the only way to stop it. And this is not a conspiracy. So this is what's been done in the 1940s. The IMF, International Monetary Fund, put out a paper in 2015 titled, quote, The Liquidation of Government Debt. And it outlines something that we call financial repression. And it says that in this paper... Quoting it, it says here, quote, we suggest that once again, financial repression may be part of the toolkit deployed to cope with the most recent surge in public debt in advanced economies. So what they're saying, it says here, quote, financial repression is most successful in liquidating debt when accompanied by inflation. For the advanced economies, real interest rates were negative half the time. So what, they, what they're saying in this paper is the goal to get rid of the debt is to lock you in into the bond market that pays a very low yield when you have high inflation. So they inflate their debt away, trapping you in the system so there's no escape out for you, and stealing your wealth to bring theirs back down. It's a very, very scary thing. Now, we've seen this in, in, in some shape or form already, but it's only getting worse. And unfortunately, it appears that it's the government's only way out. Damned if you do, damned if you don't, uh, and you and I are caught in the middle. Now, what do you do? Well, you get out while you still can. Buy gold, buy Bitcoin, buy some houses, buy, some, buy something, because otherwise you're going to be stuck in this financial repression nightmare. If you just tune in, you're listening to The Mark Moss Show. Of course, we're always talking about the decentralized revolution, how three revolutionary cycles are converging, and today we just broke down the 80-year financial revolution cycle and exactly what's happening. Hopefully, 
This isn't meant to scare you. It's to tell you what's coming so you can prepare. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Leave me a comment. Hit me up on social media. I want to hear that you're listening to the show. I want to hear you getting some value. And please, if I can, ask a favor. Would you please rate and review this show on the podcast player? That's what I got. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time.